Let's talk about our social reform movements in the antebellum time period, which is your time uh, before the Civil War, so about your 1830s uh, to 1860s. Okay, so your social reforms come out of the Second Great Awakening, and the Second Great Awakening was a religious revival, uh, but what's really important about it is that it's going to spur on uh, social reform movements. Okay, so one of the first ones will be abolition, right? So as people are getting more in touch with the Bible, more in touch with their religion, they decide they need to make the place a better world. And why not start with abolishing slavery? So, um, you know, free blacks in the North have always been trying to, you know, get an equal footing, right? Um, move the move their status up. So they would do a lot of self-help associations, um, you know, black churches, black schools, that kind of thing to kind of give them a leg up and hopefully compete with white society. Our first African-American newspaper is the Freedom Freedom's Journal. Now, um, Although the North does not want slavery and they even start to uh, outlaw slavery in northern states, it doesn't mean they're not discriminant free. They don't necessarily welcome blacks to their area and don't think that they should be equal. So there's still a lot of discrimination even when African Americans are able to go up north. Okay, so one of our first abolitionists is David Walker, and he writes his an appeal to the colored citizens of the world. And in his appeal, he says we need immediate emancipation now. We're not going to wait. We don't need gradual. We need it now. And look, if the whites don't want to give us emancipation, our freedom, then we can take it. We can take it in a violent slave revolt. And so he, that's what he's advocating for. Now, this doesn't happen, you know, not a massive, you know, nationwide slave revolt. Uh, David Walker and others go to a conference in 1830 and they realize that let's let's try some political, legal political methods first, right? Petitions, protests before we resort to the um, all-out slave revolt. Okay, now Nat Turner doesn't get the message, and he's going to go ahead and have a revolt anyways, although he does get a message. He gets a message from God. So Nat Turner was a slave and a preacher, and he had a vision from God um, you know, that, that he needs to kill the serpent and that what is uh, – first will be last and what is last will be first. So he takes that to mean slavery, right? That, um, you know, slaves are last, whites are first, and that's going to flip. All right. So he decides to um, have a slave rebellion. He gets uh, 60 slaves together. They kill 55 white men, women, and children. Now his slave revolt is kind of known for being, I guess, particularly gruesome in that they do kill the slave children and I'm sorry, the white children and babies. Typically, they might be a little safe from a slave rebellion. But what does this show? If you're willing to kill innocent babies and children, it means you're really not happy being a slave, right? And so Nat Turner's rebellion kind of shatters that view that, you know, slaves had affection for their masters and masters had affection for their slaves and that, you know, it's not so bad. Um, so this kind of shattered that fairy tale that the South is trying to feed the North. Now they start to see, hey, maybe things are pretty bad down there. Okay, uh, the other thing that Nat Turner's Rebellion does is, um, you know, Virginia kind of says, well, maybe we should gradually emancipate the slaves. Let's try to pass a bill. Well, the bill doesn't pass. And the southern states say, no, we want slavery. We want to keep this. And so they actually tighten up their slave restrictions and laws for slaves. One thing they do is limit black movement, right? They don't want slaves gathering and starting a rebellion, right? And they also don't want them to have access to free blacks. So they're going to really limit uh, what the slaves can do and, and where they can go and who they can see. And then, of course, it'll be illegal to teach a slave to read and write. Um, you know, education is power, right? And they definitely don't want them to have that. Okay, William Lloyd Garrison is our most prominent white abolitionist. He's kind of like David Walker. He's an immediatist. He wants, uh, you know, immediate emancipation, not gradual, and also no, eman no compensation for those white slave owners. He says, look, they knew it was wrong from the beginning. The federal government is not going to reimburse them if when their slaves are freed, right? That's, sorry, financial problem, deal with it. 
Um, he's going to criticize the American Colonization Society. Remember, that was the plan uh, where they colonized Liberia and West Africa, and it was a plan to send free blacks back to Africa, although they'd never been there. Um, very few went there because they don't speak the languages, the religions, right? They don't want to go to some other continent. And then William Lloyd Garrison is saying, that's that's not solving the problem of inequality. It's saying that the races should be on separate continents. They should be separate. So it's not really solving any of the issues. Now, Garrison and some others found the American Anti-Slavery Society, and they have a three-part um, planned for abolition. So that'll be a mass printing of abolitionist materials, uh, help slaves escape when they can, and then a political campaign. So Theodore Weld and the Grimke sisters are also abolitionists. Uh, so Weld worked with Garrison a lot. Um, Weld actually married, uh, I believe it's Angelina. Sorry, I didn't change that typo. He married Angelina Grimke. So these are sisters that are abolitionists. They also worked for women's rights as well. Okay, my dog's down here. <laughs> um, okay, and so Weld publishes the Bible against slavery where he uses the Bible to um, say slavery is wrong. And then the Grimke sisters wrote the testimony of a thousand witnesses. Now, the most famous book is Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so her book, if, if it could go viral back then, it would be her book, right? And her book showed, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin showed the horrors of slavery, right? Uh, children being separated from parents at the auction block, uh, beatings, whippings, killings, raping, right? All the worst parts of slavery. She tells those tales as eyewitness accounts from slaves. And so now the Northerners know for sure that it's, it's not good. And this book was even very popular in England as well. Okay, Frederick Douglass is our most prominent black abolitionist. Uh, he was a runaway slave. He used someone's freedom papers to escape north. He could read and write as well. And so that helped him um, kind of navigate his way. Now, he goes uh, up north, right? He escapes and he attends an abolition rally. And so he's in the audience, you know, and there's a speaker speaking. And then at some point he starts talking. They're like, man, you're really good. And they pull him on stage and he talks some more. And they're like, we got to take you on a speaking tour, right? And so uh, Frederick Douglass was a good speaker, right? And also a writer. And his newspaper will be the North Star. And so uh, he'll definitely be one of a big abolitionist, but he had to be careful, right? Because he could be captured and taken back down south. Now, uh, there's a lot of newspapers to know. Frederick Douglass's is easy. It's the North Star. When you're a runaway slave and you're heading north at night, you follow the North Star. So keep that in mind. Okay, so Journer Truth is our most uh, kind of popular and influential female um, black abolitionist, and she was a, was a freed woman in New York, and so she fought for abolition as well as women's rights, and so she's got quite a few pamphlets and, and essays that she wrote. Uh, the Underground Railroad. Okay, so this, so we've got our literature campaign, right, our media campaign, and how do you help slaves escape? Well, the Underground Railroad, and so this is um, not a real railroad, right? It's a figurative, right? It's a network of paths and roads and um, lodging for the runaways to stay during the day, right? They would walk at night and then, <coughs> sorry about that, escape you know, to their freedom by night. And um, Harriet Tubman, they called her the conductor, right? The figurative conductor. And she led at least 300 people to freedom. There was actually a bounty on her head of over $40,000. And um, we estimate maybe a thousand slaves escaped a year. So not that many escaped through um, by running away. Most slaves got their freedom from purchasing it by being able to work odd jobs. Okay, um, now what we'll eventually get in 1850 is a stronger fugitive slave law in response to the Underground Railroad. Okay, come here, girl. <laughs> Poor dog, it's ruining my video. Okay, political campaign is the third part. So they will uh, petition Congress to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. That will eventually happen. 
They want to end the interstate uh, slave trade right between states and then ban admitting new slave states. Now, that's the big one. This is what starts the Civil War is when those territories come in as slave states um, fighting over whether or not they should have slavery is going to be the big thing. And then we see our number of abolitionist societies grow as well as members. Okay, women's rights. So women's status now has shifted from Republican motherhood to separate spheres in the cult of domesticity. So separate spheres is saying men and women you know, have different spheres. Men are outside of the home, women are inside of the home. And the cult of domesticity glorified woman's role as a homemaker, right? This is a wonderful job. I love it. Okay, so now some problems are that social reforms and most women, women were the, you know, doing these social reforms, right? And it's middle class women because they've got the time, right? And they're kind of close enough to where these things are happening to care about it. Well, this brings them outside of the home. And so there is going to be some conflict on that. Okay, so some of the reforms that women worked on were, of course, abolition and then prison and mental health reform. Dorothea Dix is going to start this. Um, her mother was uh, committed, and so as she kind of went to the asylum, she saw the um, bad conditions, right? And then um, if you were mentally ill, you were basically jailed, right? You were basically locked up, not given any treatment, any chance to get better. Even if you were mentally retarded or handicapped, you're basically put in jail when, you know, there's so many things you can do to help people, uh, you know, have a normal life and and cope with those issues. And then of course, prisons were bad. They would lock up, you know, teen boys for stealing food with mass murderers. And so she'll expose that. And we actually do get um, some reform there. Okay, education reform. Horace Mann is the father of American education and he realizes we need education standards like for reading, writing, and arithmetic. What should first graders learn, second graders, third graders? What should you know by the time you graduate from high school? And then he said, wow, let's make sure teachers are qualified. Let's set some criteria. You know, perhaps they should have to graduate from college um, and have so much education or pass a test and have so much training every year. Okay, and they also start recruiting female teachers. They realize, hey, we've got a wealth of knowledge here. Okay, so back to the women's rights movement. So women worked on all these movements, but of course women's rights will be dear to them. And the women's rights movement is really rejecting the cult of domesticity, right? In those separate spheres. And they're challenging those traditional gender roles. They even said, you know, women being stuck in the home is like domestic slavery. We're enslaved to those men. Now, they do get some gains in this early movement, mostly just property rights for married women um, in some states, not all states. Okay, the Seneca Falls Convention is the big women's rights convention. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott will start that. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the top picture. And they write the Declaration of Sentiments, and it starts all women and men right, or all men and women are created equal, and then the declaration goes on to say all the reasons that women should have equality. Now, of course, suffrage or the right to vote or the franchise is uh, the cornerstone of their movement, right? That's the biggest right that women are fighting for, and Susan B. Anthony will lead the suffrage movement all the way, uh, 1880s, I think, maybe 1890s, she's still alive fighting for suffrage, and so women don't actually get the right to vote till after World War One. So World War One ends in 1919 and we prove that we can, you know, work like men. So therefore we can vote like men and they'll actually pass the law. And I think voting starts in 1920. Okay, so those are your major reform movements. I hope this helps you with your next quiz or test and subscribe so you don't miss all these wonderful videos.